All right, everybody. Welcome to another HVAC time training. So today we're going to be going over um, this air handler call. Uh, so what we've got here is a uh, we got a chill water air handler with chill water coil, and we're flowing through uh, just a regular squirrel cage blower into our duct. And on the right side there, you're looking at just a standard uh, VAV. Now, the complaint that's come through here is we have a, a low static complaint for the uh, air handler for the building. Uh, this is a multi-story building. And so um, we need to determine why is our static pressure so low? That's, that's the initial complaint. And then we're going to build from there on how do we troubleshoot that. So with this, you get there, you're on site, you see your, your VFD uh, there just below the air handler is running at 60 hertz. And uh, we're only able to put out about 70 degree air out of the air handler. And we've got a 0.6 inch water column. So where do you start? What's the, what's the beginning point from here? You know, you've got these conditions, now what? What do you do with it? Um, you know, listen, let's get some conversation going. You know, for those of you who've maybe kind of seen some of these things before, why would we have only 0.6 with a 60 hertz fan? Now, keep in mind, this is a commercial system. This is a commercial building. So we're maintaining a supply static pressure set point of one inch. Um, that is the, the goal for this building. Uh, the air handler is on the, uh, the bottom level for this building. So uh, one air handler runs the entire building space. Uh, the next question is a bypass open. That's a good question. So that is a reference to say a constant volume system versus a variable volume. This is a variable volume. So we don't have a true bypass. We have um, uh, a VFD that's controlling that. So uh, um, for those who may not be familiar, you know, air handlers before we started going into a variable volume. Now, technically we had variable volume and we had uh, guide vanes on the air handler uh, itself. And you'll see this in a lot of older equipment, even RTUs, um, they may have VFDs retrofitted onto them now, but at one time they either had guide vanes, very similar to what a chiller would use, or they have, um, a bypass deck, or sometimes it just be a, it would be a hot and cold deck air handler. So we have a multi deck, and the uh, depending on the orientation of the dampers would depend on how much air went through each deck, and what decided what position the damper was in was the zone set point. So if we were close to satisfied, we'd be bypassing a lot of air. If we needed more air, then uh, we would open up to say to the the chill water deck. Anyway, um, so yes, variable system, we are not using a bypass. Uh, so check the blower belt. Okay, so let's say you check it and the belt is, is in good condition. You're happy with it. Now, let's carry that a little further though. So what would checking the belt do for you? You're trying to verify if it's in a poor shape, say it's uh, if it's busted or got an issue, right? So that would be kind of the assumption. Um, so that could justify our, uh, our our static, absolutely. So if we had, a, if we had a, a belt that was having an issue, we wouldn't, uh, or we would struggle make, making static set point of our one inch. That is possible. But it carries further than that. So let's say, okay, um, then why is our so what that would mean is if we had a belt issue and we couldn't meet static set point, then we would theoretically have low airflow, correct? So let's throw another variable in there for you. Low airflow uh, would typically lower your uh, your supply air temperature because you're moving the air slower but we have 70 degrees. So what is our temperature split across our chill water cool at the moment? It's 10 degrees. That's not very much. It's not proper. So when you factor both of those in together, if we, if we were truly not moving enough air, 
then we would not only have a low static, we would also have a low supply air temperature. That is not our current condition. So just something to throw in there. We do have a supply air set point of 55 degrees. I did not put that in any of my graphics. I didn't think about that. I should have done that. I should have put the set points. Anyway, the set points are one inch of static on supply and a 55 degree air leaving temperature. Uh, Let's see. Fresh air. OK, so uh, you check the fresh air. I did not depict that on this uh, schematic, but the the fresh air in the system is uh, uh, running at a consistent, you know, 10 percent flow. It's not too much. Um, and you actually check the true return air temperature without the mixed air. So technically that 80 degrees could be considered mixed air because it is a reading of the return and the outside air being blended together. So even at the actual return air, you're still pulling in about 79 degrees, you know, with just a little bit of that fresh air coming in and, and bringing it up to the 80. Uh, all right, static center uh, could be bad or need calibration. Okay, that's a fantastic point. Uh, we put our manometer onto the duct itself and we confirm that the static sensor is reading accurate at about 0.6 inches of water column. Uh, cooling operation is building warm. All VAV open, static will drop. Why only 70 degree supply? Okay, uh, you are on the right track with that. Yes. Um, we have to think about that. We're only outputting 70 degrees, we've got 80 in. Now those VAV boxes, you know, I've only depicted one, but in the in reality, you would have you know dozens of them coming off of this primary trunk. So each of those are going to be open to a maximum because they're all going to be trying to satisfy a space set point of let's say somewhere. It's, there are averages between 72 to 75 uh, space set point. So with an 80 degree return, we could pretty well confirm that the majority of our space, we just have a common return at that in this scenario. So the majority of our space is well above set point. So all of those boxes are going to be calling for maximum air, uh, which because they're calling for so much air, we're going to have to move the fan a lot faster in order to satisfy our, uh, our, our static set point. But we're already running our fan at 60 hertz so we can't speed the fan up anymore so uh, yes it is very possible that in this scenario we are running a low static because our um uh our fan is having or our all of our vav boxes are having to open up so much in order to try to supply the air so then what should cue us there is that 70 degree supply air. Um, why is that 70 degrees? So what do we start to check in order to confirm that? What's, what's our steps there? Uh, let's see, what temp, chill water loop, uh, you got a chiller problem. Let's see, uh, so the water loop, it runs a 45 degree loop on this particular building. Uh, I check the VFD is actually giving a 60 hertz call. Okay, that's a good point. So one thing to keep in mind, since we have a VFD, we can, we're can we reading on the display of the drive. So let's say you walk up to it, it says it's outputting 60 hertz and we're within RLA on the motor. So no, no immediate problems there. Uh, you'll need a true RMS meter in order to uh, to properly check it. So you do that on the output terminals of the drive in some safe way without hurting yourself. And uh, you do confirm through your meter that you've got full output voltage and it is coming back at a, at a 60 hertz signal. So you can confirm with that that you feel confident the drive is actually outputting what it says it is. So now what? Um, we should have a 45 degree chill water loop. So why are we still only getting 70 degrees? Any ideas? Uh, so it's truly 45, that coil isn't flowing right. Uh, valves feeding the chill water open. Excellent question. 
Yes. So you check the chill water valve and it is, it says on the automation system. So building like this, you have to think um, the automation has, uh, um, has a front end of some kind. It's going to have a building automation to run all of this together. So it was telling you on the automation that the valve is in full open position at the actuator and you were able to go and verify physically that the actuator is actually in the full open position and is feeding the water through there. So actuator is wide open. Now what? Uh, too much airflow. Okay, so um, we have too much air which could explain only a 10 degree, but our issue with too much air is the 0.6, you know, uh, if we were truly feeding enough air for what the system is calling for, why are we only maintaining a 0.6 water column? You know, why, why can't we, we satisfy that? So that would be my argument to, do you have a good reason why we couldn't satisfy static and satisfy our space load, even though we're moving too much air. Because at that point, you would think, you know, moving too much air, you process more sensible, but you leave all the latent. And in our particular example, where our uh, thermostats are only controlling based off of sensible temperature, we're not monitoring humidity in the building. So, um, uh, so the, yes, I see your VAVs are, are too open. That is correct, but they're open because of what? We, we can't satisfy set point. So we have to satisfy set point in order to start pulling those back. Um, so we're going to run a much higher fan speed until it's so that we can supply more cold air to the space in order to start to cool it down to start to allow the VAVs to begin to close. Um, insufficient blower. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, let's see. Dirty filters. Okay. So, um, we think dirty air filters. There's, there's two thoughts to that. First, uh, we do, a, do a visual check and, um, uh, the visual check showed a clean, the clean filters. The filters are not that dirty. They keep up with their maintenance on this building. Um, at least for their filter changes at minimum. Let's see. And then the dirty filters piece does go back to what does that do to you? It lowers your total air volume that you can move, which would mean that I would expect to see um, a colder supply air temperature. So being the fact that our supply air um, is higher, I... Uh, I think I think we're if anything, it goes back to we're moving a lot of air instead of not moving enough air. Um, so we'd have a low delta T if the filter was dirty. Yes. Uh, well, we have a low if the filter was dirty. Uh, well, it depends on where we're measuring it, right? So if we're measuring it pre and post coil, then technically a low delta a a restricted filter will reduce the air volume which should increase the delta t wouldn't it because the air is having more uh, contact time with the coil which is allowing the coil to take more of that air's heat i see any more valves in play bypass maybe a temp drop doesn't make sense with 45 degree water. I agree with you. Um, there are there is no bypass, so this is a uh, at least not at the air handler. Um, I would say that honestly, I didn't fully factor that thought in. This would be a variable. This would be a variable flow loop. So instead of having a bypass assembly. We are just varying the flow through the loop in order to control um, to control our flow. Uh, so in this particular case, um, uh, there are there's no other valves at the air handler to to affect us uh, from too warm. 
Let's see, is the economizer in the scenario? Oh yeah, we see that full open minimum, no economizer. Uh, yeah, so the economizer or outside air intake, it's, it's, we're saying the same thing, right? Um, it, it, it would, they do the same function. Uh, it's just different terminology. Not enough water makeup. Uh, not enough malt. So Tommy, please elaborate a little more. Uh, maybe water flows low. Maybe air inside coils. Okay, air inside the coil is a is a very valid point. Now, there's things that we can do to try to um, uh, try to catch that. So, the easiest and simplest is we try to purge the air. Um, now, this is on the first floor of of a multi-story building, but we try to purge the air to the system. Um, so, you would go to the top of the coil by where the valve is at. And you try to bleed it, but honestly, you don't really get hardly any air back out of it. It's it's not really a thing. Um, let's see. Flow. Let's see, sorry. Too much. High delta. Yes, high delta T. Uh, Z rock. I see. I see your. Your correction there. Yes. High delta T if we had dirty filters. If your water coil is fouled up. So by fouled up, do you mean probably internally? So there's some things we can do to check for that. What would that be? Uh, what is the temp post coil? Is there scaling or air in the system? All right. So we're all we're all on the right track. Excellent. Okay. Next slide. Bam. Uh you know what? I just realized I did that backwards. Oops. So imagine the 45 is on the bottom because that should be your entering. <laughs> and the uh, the 28 and the 65 are on top. I just realized my mistake there. Either way, you get the point. Uh, short of just flipping those those entering and out and leaving numbers around. Uh, there's your your loop numbers. So uh we'll say this this particular air handler does not have a strainer i saw i see a couple of comments referencing strainers so no strainer on this one uh it is a closed loop system so we don't have any kind of uh um storage um tank or anything of that nature so we've got 45 entering at 30 psi and we're leaving the coil at 65 degrees with a 28 psi We've already tried to um, uh, we've already tried to uh, uh, purge air, and the air we purged, or we didn't get anything other than just pure water back out the top of the coil. We didn't really get any kind of air, anything of that nature to move. Um, let's see. Let me try to catch up on the comments here. We got a really good chat going here. Keep it going, guys. Uh, is there scale? So could it be the the coil is dirty and scaled up, which means low heat exchange. Um, so in, in terms of coil being scaled on the outside of the coil, meaning the air side, uh, I would say that that would that should react very similar to just a dirty coil, and which would ultimately mean we've got say low airflow. Um, Let's see. If we're talking about being scaled inside the coil, uh, that is that is possible, uh, and that's part of what we're going to try to troubleshoot. Uh, is the pump VFD being controlled properly? It may have a pump issue. That is a good question. So we can go check the pump at some point, and, and we'll get to that. Um, let's make sure we've got everything covered here at the air handler before we move on to the pump. So part of my Part of my objective here in this is to try to show um, uh, to show that we're uh, uh, going through the full troubleshooting step. So I'm trying to walk you through the things I would I would look at. So I want to know as much of this data as I can get while I'm still still at the air handler before I start moving to anywhere else in the system. Mostly just for efficiency. That way, if 
if things start to stand out to me that might change my mind before I start running circles around the building trying to determine what my problem is. Um, have you confirmed pressure drop according to manufacturer spec? So we don't have, uh, Joshua, we don't have a manufacturer spec on this particular system. Um, so we're going to use just kind of judgment call and based off of some general rule of thumbs. So for me, a general rule of thumb for a coil, you know, typically I want a, a 10 degree uh, rise across the coil. And that usually is somewhere between 10 to 20 PSI pressure drop in most cases. It can be less than that, um, but most, most cases are going to be around that. So that's, that's, that's what I've got to go off of at this point. I don't have the proper data, so I've got to start making some experience decisions. Um, yep. Uh, scale up, pressure drop, pressure differential. So you see pressure differential is 2 PSI in this particular case. So given what I just stated about, yeah, so uh, pressure drop is low, low. Okay, yeah, y'all are on. I'm starting to catch up. Uh, water is be fast. So I see, Watson, you say well, the water would be uh, too fast. So let's talk about what happens when we have... Um, high flow versus low flow. So in a situation like this, the greater the pressure drop, the, uh, the more total GPM that will be flowing. The less the pressure drop across the coil, the less total GPM that that coil has going through it. So in this particular case, if we're expecting, or say a rule of thumb of 10 to 20 PSI, uh, for a coil like this, but we've only got about two PSI and we have a really high uh, uh, temperature rise. So we're talking a 20 degrees temperature rise plus a low uh, pressure differential that would indicate to me that uh, we're, we're not moving enough water. We've got a low flow. So uh, so at that point, obviously, fat, you know, it's not going too fast. Uh, so that's what I'm seeing so far. You know, analyzing this data, this is what the data is telling me. Uh, so I think the coil is scaled up internally or uh, dirty water as in mud like. OK, so if we did think because it is it is a very real possibility, even being a closed loop chill water system, uh, if the chemical treatment hasn't been done properly then the inside of that pipe will begin to rust and uh, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll have a very like orangish, just rust color. Look like liquid, it would look like literal liquid rust in severe cases. It's pretty nasty. So if we wanted to check to see that, we could do a, um, a flush on the coil itself. Now to do that, then... We would have to uh, say close our. Uh, we it wouldn't be the best thing. We technically would close our entering valve and then try to um, try to flush through a valve on the bottom of the coil or in a lower section to see if we could force water back through the um, the heat exchanger in order to um, uh, in order to. to try to push anything that may be in there out. Now, in a particular case like this, there's, I wouldn't suggest doing that for literally flushing the whole coil. You could do that as a means of a test. So you could isolate and then back flush through the coil to test if that coil has any heavy sediments. If it does, uh, you should fairly quickly start to see those sediments coming out into a bucket or something that you would cap capture that water in. Um, so in this particular case, we do that. Say we try that procedure real quick and we, uh, the water comes back fairly clean. Like it's not, it's not showing us any symptoms of having a lot of scale. The, the water's uh, a proper treatment color. So a lot of times it'll be kind of like a pinkish color, right? So we're getting that color back. It doesn't have any heavy sediment or anything else inside of it. Obstruction inside the coil. Uh, so I would expect if we had a uh, something inside the coil restricting us, uh, like a severe uh, ob obstruction, then I would expect a much higher uh, pressure drop across the coil. But 
even though I had a high pressure drop, I would expect to see uh, a low, I'm sorry, a really high um, temperature rise as well, which the high temperature rise would indicate a flow issue uh, typically, but also having you know a higher pressure differential would also indicate a really high GPM. So those two things would conflict with each other. But it's not what we have. We have uh, what we're considering a high temp rise and a low pressure differential, um, which would mean low water flow, water inside. I would think pressure drop would be greater. I agree. Um, all right, so we're all still on the same track. Okay. It's good. Not sure. If, uh, so I think I think low water flow, maybe inside water, dirty. Oil is dirty. Okay, so we just talked about that. Uh, in terms of, uh, it's not as easy with the chill water piping because a lot of times Z Rock, you know, with water source heat pumps, you've got some kind of flex um, uh, flex pipe, you know, that you can hook up to it, and it's fairly easy to disconnect those. Uh, when you start dealing with a pipe like this, it's usually flanged, and you don't want to break that flange. You, you really want to find some kind of valve somewhere in the system to use for, for draining and flushing. Water intake scaled up, uh, see water restriction after the coil outlet and the gauge. Uh, restriction after the coil outlet and gauge. Uh, that's a good point. Um, yeah, that's a good point. So Joey, that would be difficult to troubleshoot or it, you know, it, it, it Ultimately, it is. We would have to just we we would have to start to see the symptoms somewhere. So, if the let's say the 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 restriction was after the um, the entering valve gauge, uh, which would be the thirty psi, then. Um, uh, I would expect to see a higher pressure differential than we do, which we, we don't have. We don't have a higher pressure differential, but I would expect to maintain a high temp rise on the coil. Um, so the uh, if the restriction was, say, after the leaving uh, side, which is the, the 65 and the 28 PSI, so for that scenario, uh, I would exp I would have to go see what pressure we have at the pump because our pump pressure should correlate to our um, uh, to our coil pressure. You know, the leaving side of the coil. It all ought to be within within range of each other. So we can do that momentarily. So what we're going to do to continue with your theory is we're going to put a pin in in that uh, until we get to the pump side of the system i have closed loops that will get muddy had a few units off high pressure low water flow. yep uh, that doesn't fix the airflow improve once uh, yes uh, so everything hvacr hvacr is correct you know at this point we have determined and, and i would say that our static issue which was the original call um uh is a symptom of a coil issue so because our coil isn't processing the load properly which at this point we can we can say based off of our pressure drop across the coil and based off of our temperature rise across the coil that coil is not moving enough water to process our load so the symptom of that coil is our space begins to uh, to get you know above set point, which is going to force all of our VAVs to open up, and as that happens, our fan isn't going to be able to maintain that one inch static with that entire uh, uh, branch system wide open, trying to satisfy the space. So uh, until we start to cool the space more. We're not going to get those VAVs to close down. And so until those VAVs close down, we're never going to get that fan to satisfy statics at that point and begin to back off. It is common. 
Yes, we did verify that static is correct. Uh, James, I see, I see uh, your comment there. On VFD, did, did we check the valve? Isn't stuck or full? Yes, we did check. We did verify the valve uh, and the actuator are opening and uh, to the 100% they're being called for. Uh, sometimes a uh, circuit setter can become a strainer. That is true. We do not have a circuit setter on this particular setup. They didn't spend that much money. So uh, we've literally just, we've got maybe, we've got a couple of isolation valves. We'll say they're butterfly valves. I don't have them de depicted here. But other than that, we've got a, um, uh, a chill water actuator control and flow. That actuator, uh, I'm going to say, is just a, a another butterfly valve. So um, nothing fancy, nothing out of the ordinary. Uh, I might have missed it, but did you say the valve is very? Yes, I, I did. Yes, the valve is verified open. Um, and the water TXV. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's a good one. Okay, all right. So I think we're we're all in the same pressure or pressure. Gee whiz, we're all in the same line of thought. We don't have proper flow. We don't have proper pressure. Something is happening on our chill water side. So we look at the building as a whole. We see that we're working on the first floor. This one air handler is serving all four floors of the building. There's a there's a main trunk that comes out. It hits all the first floor and then it goes up the side of the building and hits uh, the other three floors as it goes up. Um, this is an actual design. I, I would say this is an older design. I don't see many new buildings being done this way, but I've definitely got some older buildings that this is their literal setup. So we see that our pumps and our chiller are on the roof. Uh, so there's some things we have to think about there in terms of elevation and head weight. So what thoughts do we have from here? What are we expecting when we, once we get up to the roof and we see where the pump and the chiller is? Um, see, I think uh, checking water pressure at the pump. Yep, checking that the pump's VFD is on, it's, it's up. Uh, check valves. I will... Well, if all the other units are cooling properly, I would generally indicate that the pump is, is pumped. Okay, all right, so we're, we're on the same track here. We're on the same track. You're doing a good job, guys. Keep walking through it. Don't let it go. So we get to the pump. What do we need to know? We need to know what our pressure is doing, right? So we've got our inlet coming in on the suction side. We've got our outlet going out. And we get our gauge readings at 1 PSI entering and 12 PSI leaving. Now, I made a comment earlier that uh, our pump entering should be, you know, relatively close to the, uh, um, the chill water coils leaving pressure. Now, that chill water coils leaving pressure was 28 PSI, right? So why do I have one PSI? Now, you mentioned earlier that uh um you know joey joey specifically mentioned earlier that what if we have a leak or a restriction after one of the gauges so do we have is that our condition here do we have a restriction after the gauge on the leaving side of the chill water coil between that and the pump anybody have any ideas They check valves. Well, if all the other units are cooling properly, I would generally indicate the pump is pumping correctly. Okay, so uh, Joshua, I would agree with you, except uh, and I know I've, I've covered a lot of ground here so far, but this is the only primary air handler for the entire building. Um, see, low water pressure on the roof. PSI says otherwise. Faulty gauges. Okay, so that's a valid point. Don't trust the gauges on the system. Use your own. I agree. You do that, you do confirm, though, that the gauges we're, we're seeing uh, are reading accurately. Even with your gauges that you trust, you hook them up, you thread them into the quarter-inch ports, and you get the same readings. 
uh, but that is a that is an excellent uh, just proof of 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 the, of the readings. We need to make sure that what we're reading, the data we're taking in, is accurate. Bad data in, bad data out. Um, if every unit in the building schooling, uh, that gives issues on the first floor. Okay, so Xerox, I think you're uh, probably getting back to is there a restriction? So why somebody explain why our air handler leaving is 28 psi but our pump entering is only one psi we need we need to there's a huge disparity here because there's something else that should stand out to you as well and that's the supply side what's your supply side pressure versus what it was at the air handler something doesn't add up here What's not making sense? Why are these pressures not lining up? Strainer at the pump. Pump is cavitating. Uh, the pump is cavitating. It is. 70 feet head pressure will be about 30 PSI. So if the pressure difference it might be just gravity effect on the in and out of pressures. Good job, Joey. Yes. The rule of thumb is at least the one I go by. I think the actual number is like six point, uh, was it seven or eight something something per per what I think fifteen feet of elevation. Uh, if somebody remembers the exact number, you're welcome to throw it in there. I just use a general rule of thumb of about um, uh, twenty. I'm sorry, seven seven psi per floor, which most commercial buildings have a 15 foot floor you know it's fairly generic um uh so um so if we're expecting about seven psi per floor and we have four floors in total then I would expect from roof down, we're going to have a, a head weight of about 28 or so PSI, which is what I was depicting here. Our gauge is reading roughly one PSI and we're getting about 28 PSI leaving our coil. So that would have been something. I didn't bring it up because I wanted to prove the example, but me... Um, uh going okay so 20.23 per foot james that's that's a good i haven't seen that value before that's a good value um but so me you know that would have been something that stood out to me early on but that's me with experience so you coming at it with without that standpoint um because that was one of the questions that never got asked or at least i didn't see it in the comments of well how tall of a building do we have you know what's what is our our head weight that we're dealing with and where is the pumps even at that part never came up so that would have been one of my earlier questions having experience with this um, that could have really sped up your troubleshooting process and time on this particular system is okay what is my pressures what are my pressure drops 28 psi okay that's interesting what is my head weight oh my head weight is about 28 psi worth of head I don't have enough pressure in the system. Um, so that's the that's the disparity between those. If that didn't stand out. Uh, let's see. Pump on roof. Yes, pump is on roof. HU is on. Oh, OK. I see what you did. Uh, let's see. Um, so the P, uh, 28 PSI is because air handler is downstairs, but the pump is on the roof. Pump not strong enough to sustain the pressure drop and water column height. No, no. I would say that this we don't see any evidence that the pump isn't strong enough. What we see, can, how about this? Can somebody tell me what we see? What, do, what does this tell us at this point? Uh, so undersized motor. Uh, I would think not, Joshua. You've said it twice now. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, yeah, it, it's makeup water. So we're too low on water. Period. 
Uh, there's not enough water in this loop. So we have a makeup line. It's going to be somewhere close. Typically, it's going to be somewhere close to the top of the loop. Not always. Um, uh, the pump does have a VFD. And the pump VFD was running at 100% trying to uh, meet uh, loop defer deferential requirements. We couldn't meet the loop deferential set point because, well, we just don't have enough water to, to push it like that. So um, uh, we have the one. To, so the, the makeup water should always be piped into your entering side or your return side to the pumps. And uh, my personal preference is I want to see a uh, uh, I want to see my entering side of the pump with it running. All of this is while running. I want to see the entering side of my of my uh, pump or the minimum pressure on the system to be about 10 psi above um, uh, um, my head weight. So in this particular case, I'm at the roof with the pump. Okay, so we're up here at the roof, and we're seeing what our we're, we should have no head weight from here. You know, the pipes aren't going up, doing anything crazy. We're just coming out. We're going through. You know, we're pulling, we're pushing through the chiller, and um, uh, you know, we're everything is is standard here. So our head weight should be about ultimately roughly zero psi. So I want to see about 10 PSI um, coming into the pump. And um, uh, with that, I want my pressure regulator, my makeup valve regulator, to be set at about that 10 PSI range. So let's say we walk over there. And what we determine is uh, just, uh, is that a calibration? So thing we see all the time uh, most of those pressure regulators they have a little locking nut on them just due to natural vibration those things will back off and uh, eventually because they loosen up they uh, it'll let that adjustment stem kind of just over the years rattle out of place and then eventually you get to a point where uh, we just whether it be somebody bleeding water at some point something happened and we lost the water in the loop and once that happened that valve wasn't set correctly anymore to replenish the water so we just go over there we calibrate it we tighten down our locking and we get our pump up to about 10 psi entering which allows us to push to about 30 psi on the leaving side so now we've got uh we've got flow our pump drive is able to back down because we're starting to meet our uh, loop set point requirements so now what do we expect what do we expect from here anybody got any ideas we're up prv failed on makeup yes any ideas what do we want to have happen, right? What do we, yeah, we, pretty much. That's it, Frylock, Michael. We expect it to work. So from here, what we would, what my expectations would be, again, my entering and leaving are, um, uh, Entering and leaving are reversed by, by accident. So my 45 and 58 should have been on the bottom of the coil. Anyway, um, we've got more water in the loop. So now we can actually flow GPM through the loop. And that was our big issue was because the loop had too little water in it. It wasn't out of water, but it didn't have enough water in order to actually create the GPM flow that we needed. So once we put more water into the loop, we gave that water more volume to move through the loop. Uh, that allowed us to start processing the coil down better. And let's say after about an hour's worth of runtime or a couple hours worth, we start, you know, we immediately, so the first things we would see is our pressure drop would, would improve across the coil. 
And because of a high load, we might still see a little bit of a, um, of a high rise, but instead of being 20 degrees, it might only be 12 or 13, 14 degrees across the coil, but that's with the hot pull down. So as our pull down happens, our supply air goes from doing about 70 degrees to about 60 degrees, which is much closer to what we would expect it to do. As that 60 degrees starts to push into the space, after a little bit of time, our thermostats start coming down, the space starts cooling down, our return air starts cooling down a little bit, then we're gonna see those VAVs start to close off and they're gonna, they're gonna start to satisfy because, hey, we're starting to come up on set point, I don't need as much air. So as they begin to back off, that allows our static pressure to build in the system and we're going to start to meet our set point of one inch water column. So once we hit that set point, then the fan can slowly start to back down as the space begins to cool down. So that's how we are able to get the fan back to 50 hertz. As the fan is able to back off and we're making static set point, we're going to see that our, uh, lead, our, our uh, supply air is also able to meet set point at 55 which is going to result in our chill water valve being able to back down even more um, to allow uh, just to restrict flow so that we maintain our supply air set point instead of overshooting, which is not good for the chiller, which is then how we end up getting where we're, we're floating at about a 10 PSI uh, drop across that coil with a 10 degree rise with what I would consider to be a, a, moderate or a a, uh, a full load you know not a not a hot pull down load of 80 degrees but we've got a full load of a 75 in a 55 out and everything able to maintain and 50 hertz on, a, on the uh, the vfd to maintain one inch of water column would still indicate that we've got a decent amount of load on this air handler um you know, being able to be still needing to run 50 hertz just to maintain our set points. So, like I said, this might take a couple of hours to start to see these numbers. Your drive may continue to run at that 60 hertz and you may not meet static set point for another hour, hour and a half, two hours. But the, the very first indicator that you've done something right is going to be your, uh, your pressure drop across the coil your temp rise, and you're going to start to see your supply air lower down. You're also probably going to see your chiller is going to thank you for it because what we didn't talk about is whatever symptoms the chiller was having because, well, it didn't have much GPM either. But that was a separate service call. And honestly, the customer didn't even realize they had their chiller was acting weird because, well, they were still making 45 degree water uh, despite the fact that it was screaming off the edge of the roof. They don't catch that. What they caught was, hey, my my uh, building's starting to get warm, and my main air handler can't can't maintain static. You know, something's I've got an airflow problem. Something's wrong with my airflow. When in reality, you know, you had a you had a water flow problem, and we need to correct that. So that was today's exercise. Hope you enjoyed it. I find these fun. This is a good one. Uh, any final thoughts, any final questions? Otherwise, we're going to call this and move about our day. I still need to go eat lunch myself. Uh, final questions, final thoughts. Anything I missed? Does anybody have any added words of wisdom to throw in here before we, uh, before we drop out? Sensible. Your chiller on the states have a high delta T fault. Uh, well, uh, no, because they well, I wouldn't expect. So in this particular condition, I would expect the. Um, uh, so we have a, a flow, a uh, flow switch of some kind. So if the chiller gets too low on flow then it's gonna trigger that flow switch. But if we've got really low flow, then it's gonna be really easy to satisfy that set point. So I would expect that chiller to 
unload itself. Now, it, in, in reality, I could have thrown into the mix that, well, we check the, the chiller panel and let's say it was running um, a suction limiting because it was unloaded as much as it could go. It was still making set point, but it couldn't unload any further and was just barely idling along, if you will. Uh, I would have expected, you know, something like that could have been very realistic, but we still had just enough flow to satisfy our um, our flow uh, uh, sensor. So, which which was true, you know, we had enough we could keep, you know, at least a compressor loaded or or on. Um, but that would that would have been my my expectations. So typically, you're not going to see a uh, a high delta fault, but that's also because we're we're modulating how much um, how much cooling we're we're uh, we're enacting. Uh, do you need to have an air balance in uh, in your type of so? Yes, the the uh, the VAVs themselves should be air balanced at their grills, but that's going to be done should be by like a, a certified. Uh, test and balance uh, contractor or somebody that that does that. In this particular case, I don't I didn't have a reason to question that, um, so I wasn't honed in on well, are we is our test and balance okay? I would have gone more that direction if our chill water coil in our supply air temperature was uh, where I wanted it to be, but being the fact that those could not meet the parameters I was looking for. Then I, I knew I needed to chase down the coil issue uh, over um, over the uh, the air balancing problem. On a side note, check expansion tank for air. Yes, I, I did not show any kind of expansion tank in here, but that is a good note. Uh, always make sure the expansion tanks are set correctly. They should be set to. Um, uh, what you want your uh, um, uh, return your return piping to be. So the same piping that your uh, uh, makeup water valve is tied to, whatever that makeup water valve set point is, you want that um, expansion tank pressure to be at about that same uh, bladder pressure. Do, 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 do. I have flow switch, differential switch, and high delta T protection faults as well. Yeah. Yeah, the high delta T, I, I wouldn't, it's not something we commonly see. I see where the BMS cycles VAV zones to bring load down. Uh, it can, it can. I mean, it's something they could program in. Yeah, more. So yeah, I mean, in terms of the residential questions, so I'll do some lighter systems in the future. Um, you know, this was just kind of today's example I ch chose to go with. Uh, this is a APS Air Performance of Central Texas oriented uh, training. This is the focus. And so what we do is heavy commercial service. Now we have regular split systems and we have smaller systems. So we'll talk about those. But um, this training is tailored to our team and YouTube just works out really well as a platform for our team to tune in through uh, and everybody else just kind of gets the, the added benefit of that. So, um, yeah, if you are interested or if, if you're looking to move here, hiring uh, any of the above, we are in the process of hiring both Austin and San Antonio. And uh, you can go to APS-CentralTX.com. We have a, uh, um, a Join Us tab in there where you can send your application in. We really like talking to you. 10 PSI is under return pressure is what the manual says, I thought. 10 PSI under return pressure. So that's probably right. I haven't read those manuals in a long time, Frylock. Uh, I usually set mine pretty close to where I set my makeup valve, but the actual books may, you're, you're probably right, just slightly under that set point. Um, well, actually, I say slight, that, I don't know that that makes sense to me either. I'd have to just go back and look at the books. Um, 
Okay. All right, guys. Appreciate y'all. Y'all have a good day. Stay safe out there. It is still hot. It is still summer. And uh, we are not over yet. So be safe. Take care of yourself.